Hi friends, thank you for joining us again for the ASP Stories weekend bonus episode. Join us on Mondays and Thursdays where we interview amazing guests where they share with us about their adventure sports and the amazing feats that they have done. But ASP Stories is where we get to listen in as authors read their adventure stories to us. So sit back with your hot cup of tea or coffee and kick off your adventure-filled weekend by listening in while we hear more from ASP Stories. The next four ASP Stories episodes will be with Sam Manicom. Sam has spent many years traveling around the world on his motorcycle, and he's written a few books to tell all about it. In these next four episodes, he'll be reading from his books Into Africa, Under Asian Skies, Distant Suns, and Tortillas to Totems. If you'd like to find out more about Sam and get his books, you can visit him at sam-manicom.com. You can also hear his interview on the Adventure Sports Podcast on episode 149. And now, here's Sam Manicom. Chapter 3. Tailen Charlie. They are incompetent enthusiasts, and they are a mighty dangerous lot. G.C. Lichtenberg. The Egito is the lifeline to the island of Crete. For three seasons of the year, the ship bought supplies, tourists, and money to bolster this rocky island's economy. The normal four-hour stop at Heraklion, the capital city and main port, gives time for business to be conducted and for the ship's passengers to have a leg stretch on dry land. We arrived two and a half hours late, which, the captain informed everybody, he wanted to try to make back by cutting the visit short. In spite of this and the teeming rain, most of us two-wheelers decided that a leg stretch and a look-see was worth a quick soaking. Inevitably, time slipped by too fast and some of us had to make a mad dash back to the ship. We all made it except for one poor Egyptian who was still on Greek time. He arrived a couple of minutes after the last ropes were thrown ashore. While he stood on the jetty looking damply forlorn, aboard ship, his wife was screaming and shouting to anyone who would listen. Her husband had no money, no luggage, and worst of all, he'd left his passport on board. Outside the harbour, a large swell soon reached nausea levels. I was glad that I'd strapped the bike down, in spite of the Piraeus Customs Officer's weather forecast of calm. By dinner time, the decks were pretty much deserted and the air in the walkways was revoltingly tainted by the acrid smell that seemed to have an infectious effect on many of those who were still up and about. In the bar, though, a large group of German bikers were still drinking enthusiastically. I found Mike in the cafeteria, happily tucking into a small mountain of food. As all the food was included in the price of the passage, I was tempted too, but my stomach was wobbling on the borderline. However, knowing that this might be the last chance of a familiar meal for some time, I joined the small queue at the counter. I'd risk it, but positive thinking didn't take into account a drunken biker who pulled up in the queue behind me. As he breathed fumes and spittle at me from a rocking six inches away, my stomach heaved. In the morning... A hot breeze full of unfamiliar scents wafted over us as we stood at the railings watching Africa get closer. Garbage, diesel and spices were stirred into a greasy, sweaty assault on the senses that made me wonder if once again I was mad. Sally was obviously having the same thoughts. I couldn't tell what Mike was thinking. In the clammy, stale air down below, trucks idled their engines. Car drivers organised their passengers, and bikers milled around nervously making last-minute adjustments to their gear. More than a few were paying a sweaty price for the previous night's enthusiasm in the bar, but I felt excited and surprised myself at how my fear seemed to have disappeared. Fifty bikes stood with engines running, the ramp went down, and minutes later we were riding off into chaos. At a row of small, green-painted wooden offices, a round little Egyptian official flagged us down, shouting, Come quickly! In a moment, many people! Much trouble! He knew what was coming next. Customs, registration documents, insurance, immigration, temporary importation papers, and total confusion. No one knew what to do. One official was at lunch, another hadn't turned up for work that day, and no one seemed sure where the rest were, or to care. The officials who had turned up seemed to treat the chaos as normal. They were also able to combine indifference, indolence and pure arrogance into a power game that added an edge of tension to the uncertainty. 
Minutes stretched into sweaty hours. Frustration levels grew and hangovers throbbed. Tales were told by old hands of people's paperwork going missing, of bribes and of last-minute refusals for no reason at all. A biker's information underground developed as doors were finally being opened and rubber stamps were being brought out. Each little scrap of passed-on news broke down the confusion piece by piece. Sweat trickled down my neck, and my leather jacket became a real hindrance as I tried to keep track of the various bits of paperwork. But perversely, as the hours ticked by, I started to enjoy the hurry-up-and-wait pace. I felt that the adventure really had begun when the Jalalaba-clad motor tax official said, Oh, yes, misters, you must pay money, a ridiculous amount, for you to have your rubber stamp. We gently but firmly declined and told him that there must be another official who could clarify the situation. Sitting down to see what would happen next gave him the time to admire his Jalalaba. This cotton, neck-to-ankle robe seemed a perfect breezy solution to the muggy, humid air, but I wouldn't swapped it for my bike gear for a minute. Eventually our patience paid off, the taxman gave up, after five sweaty, tense hours we were done. All there was left for us to do was to bolt on our impressive temporary Egyptian number plates. Mine had a bright yellow but very battered background, and I'd no idea what the bright red Arabic slashes said. Then we hit the road, and with a dual-lane highway for most of the way, there was still just time to make it to Cairo before dark. Alexandria's grime held no attraction for us. Grubby, long-robed, brown-faced kids ran out waving and yelling excitedly as our little convoy sped past. Irrigated fields, mud-brick houses and palm trees lined the road. I couldn't stop grinning as my sweat evaporated in the slipstream. I'd never ridden with other bikers before, so this was fun, and tagging on as tail-end Charlie meant that if I did do something dumb, then maybe no one would notice. The quality of the road encouraged us to go faster. But as the daylight began to end, common sense slowed us down. The sun was slipping lower as a flaming-edged orange-red ball that seemed, in its dying moments, to hang just above the horizon for a few bonus minutes. Common sense had done us well because as the sun finally disappeared, our headlights lit up the first of the sand dunes across the road. The desert winds had blown ripple-top banks of sand as a trap for the unwary. As we neared Cairo, the road also became some sort of dog graveyard. Pathetic mound after pathetic mound lay sprawled on the litter-strewn verges, all bloody and mangled in the road itself. It was a sobering sight, and I rode on wondering how they had all managed to get killed. The roads were open with clear verges, and not particularly fast. Perhaps life for the dogs was so miserable that this was a traditional suicide sight. Perhaps the simple fact was that the dogs were totally lacking in road sense. We were heading for the camping site in Cairo's suburb of Giza. The last few kilometres were through lumpy, darkened back streets that were lined with the houses of people who were a long way from the top of the wealth scale. Our headlights lit up the square, flat-roofed, smooth-rendered boxes that were huddled together in rows of uneven terraces. In the darkness, they looked like an old man's decaying teeth. Rubbish-filled ditches lined our way where stagnant water lay in mosquito-infested pools. Sometimes the terraces were broken by stretches of wasteland that over the years had turned into rubbish dumps. Even though the scene contained the shadowy, almost biblical outline of a donkey or a camel here and there, it wasn't very welcoming after the relative luxury of the ship. But the campsite was a little oasis. Tall fences, lush grass, palm trees for shade and a security guard. Just three Egyptian pounds, or fifty pence a night, made it a touch of perfection in comparison to the outside world. Dogs barked, and mosquitoes buzzed as I drifted off to sleep in the cool of my first night in Africa. The next days were a whirl of organising the necessities of life and sightseeing. Food, money, visas, washing, bike maintenance, the pyramids, the fabulous Cairo Museum the city of the dead where people live amongst the tombs, and, of course, our first sight of the Nile, the longest river in the world. We rode all over the city from one office or site to the next. The GS felt amazingly light with all the gear stripped off, and I was surprised at how courteous most of the other traffic was. The Cairo metro area, the largest in Africa, is fed by a series of multi-lane highways. Inevitably, we found ourselves in the wrong lane for where we wanted to go, 
but the traffic always seemed to allow us to slip through, and even the police seemed to enjoy our being there. One bored Solotope policeman on a stand in the middle of eight lanes of organised chaos actually stopped the traffic for us to go on through. He threw a salute as we passed, and then his white gloved hands got the traffic going again. In 969, Cairo was actually founded by a Sicilian general called Gawar. He'd originally named the city Al Mansuria, but this was later changed to Al Cairo, the triumphant city, hence Cairo. Over history, the city has been influenced by every foreign power that has ruled Egypt, and there have been many of those, including the British, the Greeks, and the Romans, old and new. All have left their mark, and it makes sense that this is why the city is so cosmopolitan. In fact, Cairoans don't consider themselves to be Africans at all. Part of this cosmopolitan air comes, I think, from it being placed at a sort of axis point for land and sea transport in the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. Its religions must play a part too. Without doubt, this is an Islamic city, but the Coptic Christians and Jews are still visible strengths. At the pyramids, a dusty car pulled alongside me and stopped. The driver leant out and said, "Welcome to Egypt. Where are you from?" This was the first time of many that this question would be asked, but with nothing to lose, I replied, "Jersey." Partly thinking this will fox him. Ah, yes, the young man returned. A fine place. My father is a banker there. Small world, and so for that matter were the pyramids. All the photos and films I'd seen over the years had made me think that they would be enormous. Not so with the vastness of the open desert as a backdrop, but I did marvel at how they were made. Each block weighs about two tons and had been carried for hundreds of miles. I thought the Sphinx looked as if he was totally out of place amidst the tourist stalls and the touts, rather like a man who turns up to a black tie dinner wearing fancy dress. It didn't help that some thoughtless person, with no respect for history and fine lines, had stuck an antennae of some sort onto the Sphinx's bottom. The shops in the villages around the camping site were hole-in-the-wall affairs, and each seemed to specialise in just five or six items. The washing shop stocked long bars of nicotine-coloured waxy soap. They wouldn't make you washing soft or smell good, just clean. The vegetable stores were made up of any old junk that could be scavenged and cobbled together to make waist-high roadside counter for produce to collect dust on. Again, the selection was limited. Oranges. Tomatoes, potatoes, and onions were about it. But we were learning fast how many culinary variations of those ingredients there were, so long as we had our supplies of mixed herbs, garlic, curry powder, and chili. My favourite was the corn affa stall. The cook stood under a faded and patched blue awning with the tools of his trade surrounding him. As we watched, he swung into action. Inside his large oil barrel, he lit a wood fire. When the flames were high, he placed a greasy disc of steel plate over the top. This looked like an extra thick wok that had been run over and unevenly flattened. Having placed the wok, the cook fastidiously wiped his hands on his equally greasy apron before picking up what looked like a round-bottomed funnel. Into this, he poured a thick mixture of grease, flour, and water, which immediately dribbled out onto the disc in a collection of cream swirls. The swirls quickly joined together and inflated into a sort of pastry that could be either eaten savoury or as a sweet. The smell was delicious, and the sweet version was very popular, particularly with the local kids. Having risked the potential results of the cook's greasy fingers and filthy apron, we wandered back through the villages to the campsite. It was rather like playing hopscotch as we tried to dodge the puddles, rubbish, and piles of animal shit. We also had to keep an eye open for the seemingly fearless rats. Over the days rushing around the city centre, I'd grown to like the scents that emanated from many of the street food stalls. But my fresh from Europe mind didn't like the look of the food that created those tantalising smells. However delicious it smelt, slime green did not look appetising, and my pre-trip decision to try as many local foods as possible wobbled badly in those first days. In spite of all the rubbish in the open sewers, people's spirits seemed in no way dampened. For them, it was normal, and they just got on with life. As I began to realise this over the first days, I started to look past the squalor to the people themselves. The lady in the bread shop was a sweetheart. She didn't speak any English though, and her sign language was shy. We didn't speak much Arabic, 
so her daughter, who was learning English at school, was always summoned to deal with us. It was obviously a matter of pride that her daughter could speak English as well as she could. She was probably ten or eleven years old, but had the confidence and manner of someone much older. The girl had a cheeky face, which she seemed to battle with to keep under control. With us late out of our sleeping bags one morning, the lady had sold out of bread, but with a scolding waggle of her finger, the girl shot off over the street debris to return moments later, with still fresh warm loaves for us. The flat, golden-coloured, air-filled bread tastes wonderful when eaten fresh, but left until lunchtime, it would taste like cardboard. She presented the warm loaf to us with a little curtsy, another cheeky grin, and another finger waggle. Mike, Sally, and I had talked carefully about the route south, and we decided to travel together for a while. They'd also planned to go the Western Sahara route, and had ended up with the same last-minute hassles that I'd had. To my surprise, they'd organised a visa for Sudan. It only needed picking up from the embassy. We decided that I would go with them, and with luck. I'd be able to find an official who thought that two bikes travelling together would be safer, and therefore would give me a visa too. I knew from backpacking trips that the solo traveller is often treated in a completely different way from a group. I suppose that people travelling together always seem to be more self-sufficient, but a traveller on their own is more vulnerable. When travelling alone, I'd always get more invitations and offers of hospitality from the local people. I guess that my apparent vulnerability made me more approachable. Just being a stranger had often been enough of an icebreaker for a conversation to start. A new adventure would begin right there, and I'd never had a bad time by going with the flow. By moving on with Mike and Sally, I knew that I'd be losing this facet of travel. But the more I thought about it, the more it seemed that the meeting the two of them had been meant to happen. It felt like it would be good for us all, and if it ceased to be so, we could part. We walked into the Sudanese embassy and passed the rows of backpackers that were lining the lobby walls. Each, for want of something better to do, watched us, as if wanting to see what the new faces that had come to join their ranks would do. Some of these guys had been waiting for weeks for their visas. Each day they would come and queue for hours, only to be told no news yet. It had taken much longer than we'd hoped to get our letters of recommendation from the British embassy, so we arrived as the visa clerk was just closing up. But he seemed to like the look of us and showed us into a back office. With Mike and Sally telling their story, the door opened a touch further for me too. Yes, possible, he said to me, but it'll take three weeks. I cajoled a bit, and he came down to two weeks. A bit more persuasion brought it down to a week, but this time he said, "There's no guarantee." Impressed at how quickly he dropped from three weeks to one, I encouraged him a little more. Okay, okay, he said. Three days, but still no guarantee. While he turned back to Mike and Sally, I pondered the waiting rows outside and wondered how much value his three days actually had. In the upper offices, after some initial confusion, all seemed well for Mike and Sally, and I could sense their relief. This had to be my moment as well. To the side of the office sat a wizened older man who had no obvious official capacity, but he had been nodding at us in a friendly fashion. With fingers crossed, I started to present my case to him. Just as I was beginning to feel that he either had a nodding disorder and understood not a jot of English, or that I was definitely out of luck and that he was just being polite, a very dark-skinned, immaculately dressed man came storming in. He carried an air of complete authority and was shouting furiously. The nodding man pointed over and said in excellent English, "Talk to him." The vice consul's stony face regarded me from the other side of the desk. I was glad that I'd put on my best and cleanest clothes. But his stern look wasn't in the least encouraging. In fact, it was completely unfathomable, with not a twitch to indicate yes or no. Hey, friends! Thank you, thank you for all you do to keep the Adventure Sports Podcast alive and well. You listen to our amazing guests. Thanks for that. You join our Facebook group and you share your adventures. That's awesome. You join our ASP members community for discounts and to support the show. Very cool. You donate to our Patreon site, right on. But most of all, thank you for believing in the show. Thank you for joining with us to reach others to share the great stuff that adventure sports bring. We believe that adventure sports help people to live richer, more fulfilling lives. We believe that the Adventure Sports Podcast is making a positive impact in the world through physical health, emotional health, environmental health, and relational health. 
We have set the challenging goal of doubling our listener base by February the 28th. Wow, really? After nearly three years, we want to double the number of listeners in just a few weeks? You bet. And you make it possible because you believe in ASP. Thanks in advance for sharing the dream of a healthier, happier world by telling your friends about the Adventure Sports Podcast. Let's double the good. Together, we can do it. You know, we might be smack dab in the middle of winter these days, but spring is really just right around the corner. Make sure you've got one of our lightweight camp stoves ready to go in your pack for when the weather starts turning warmer. Both the 180 stove and the 180 flame are designed to burn the abundant wood fuels you find on the ground instead of requiring you to haul in heavy, messy camp fuels. Take a minute to head on over to our site at www.180tack.com to check out these American-made stoves that are built to last. You'll be helping us, and you'll be helping the Adventure Sports Podcast. Thanks, guys. Once again, I started my story, but this time I had help in Arabic from the office staff. I bought out all the official-looking paperwork I could find, including the articles from the Jersey Evening Post, which they'd done before I'd set off. As we all talked, the vice consul wrote on each of my papers. Then, without a word, he pointed to the door. I was sure I was out of luck. Just a few minutes later, a minion came out of the vice consul's office and hurried past me with my papers in his hand. I wondered which dusty backwater they were bound for. Moments later, he came back and presented them to the manager, who said no, in no uncertain terms. Around me, no one would meet my eyes. Once again, the assistant ducked back into the office where the manager was doing a perfect stony impersonation of his dark-skinned boss. Then, to my amazement, he said, OK, and grinned, as if the whole procedure had been quite normal. The office staff shared conspiratorial, friendly smiles with me, and it began to sink in that we'd all achieved something quite special. Mike and Sally were equally surprised that I'd got a visa for Ethiopia. They'd been told it wasn't possible. Maybe in Sudan, they could come with me to the Ethiopian embassy and the same plan would work again, but in reverse. Hi, Yose, Mike, Sally, Deet and I linked up again to head south down the banks of the Nile. It's a bizarre ride. You can see desert on both sides of the valley. There's a lush green strip of land that's bordered by cream-coloured sandy desolation. In the middle of the day, the heat becomes intense and the only way we found to keep cool was to keep riding with stops only in deep shade. These bum rests were always an adventure, as five bikes stopping in a seemingly deserted section of road always attracted a crowd of spectators from thin air. Orange sellers, old men on donkeys, mischievous kids and the inevitable mangy dogs would descend upon us. It was never very restful, but always an event. Pulling away from one such rest, the bike felt wrong, sluggish. Kids would often hang on to the back of the bikes as we rode away, so I checked my mirror. There were no uninvited passengers, but behind me billowed a large umbrella. Some cheeky kid had hooked it onto my luggage, and fifty faces behind us were split with broad grins. The Muslim time of Ramadan was upon us, and I was already used to the Mezuin's wailing cries of Allah Akbar, God is great, from the mosques, and didn't even mind that the first of the day happened at 4am, but the months-long fast made riding a dangerous business. The Ramadan rules stipulate no cigarettes and no food within daylight hours. This made the other road users a menace, especially towards the end of the day when everyone was grouchy and just wanted to get home. Most days we found a place to stay before the clock ticks into the danger zone, but when we didn't, nerves tingled. The other menaces of the roads were running kids, dogs, brainless goats, taxis, and one-eyed monsters. Trucks in Egypt have to be treated with respect by a lowly biker. Size matters, and the trucks were wrecked. They go too fast, and in the dusk their solitary working headlight gives you little warning. Only one headlight because, we were told, their drivers are afraid of wearing their batteries out if they use both. Smashes are common. Egypt, like France, Italy and Greece, had its own set of overtaking rules. The main rule seemed to be, if there is another vehicle in the way, expect them to pull over for you. 
This didn't always happen, so we were riding with our headlights on full beam. This made infinite sense to us, but seemed to be a source of total irritation to the local truck drivers. Don't these stupid tourists know anything? Fuel was incredibly cheap at 80 pence a gallon, but it was pretty grim stuff. A combination of low-octane petrol, heat, and the stop-go traffic soon had my bike too hot and pinking like mad. I didn't know what this nasty pinging, ticking noise was, just that it sounded awful. Was the engine going wrong already? Why was there no power when opening the throttle? I could ignore it and hope that it would go away, or bite the bullet and try to fix whatever was wrong before it got out of hand. Mike and Hyde put my mind at rest, though. Their bikes had been doing the same. Just ease off on the throttle when it happens and don't try to pull away so hard, Mike advised. Mostly it worked, though I began to think about the fact that my bike had no oil cooler and everyone else's did. The boxer's fins had been great to warm my hands on when it had been cold on the way across Europe, but now they were working overtime to cool the engine. The foot pegs were right underneath those fins, and this meant that each day my feet were sitting in boot-sized pools of sweat. Periodically, we'd come across a police checkpoint. These were ramshackle affairs made of rusting old oil drums filled with cement and straddled by a few warped wooden poles. For padding, the police had used any other debris that had been lying around. They were usually manned by dapper, khaki-clad policemen, whose dual reason for being there seemed to be to smile and to salute tourist motorbikers, and hassle everyone else. We were later told that in times of strife these roadblocks are particularly nasty affairs. Each day I was surprised and enthralled. Most of the time my education was of the enthralled type, but now and then we'd see something special that would underline how lucky we were to be Europeans. Once, just when I was looking forward to the end of the day, a cold beer and some peace and quiet, Jose and I got cut off from the others. Right in front of us, a blue pickup truck knocked down and killed a horse that was pulling a cart. Before our eyes, complete misery unfolded across the horse owner's face. In one short moment, his life savings, income and future were gone. The pickup truck had kept on going, as in fact we'd been warned we should do if we ever hit anything or anybody. I'd been struggling with the thought of doing that, but seeing the misery in front of us turn rapidly into anguished rage and frustration, I suspected that the driver would have been strung up from the nearest lamppost if he'd stayed. The temper of the inevitable crowd was sympathetically hot, and Jose and I were happy to sneak away as quietly as possible. Riding tail end Charlie held other problems for me. When you're at the back, you are reacting to what all the other riders in front of you are doing. It means that easy gaps in the traffic for them to slip into are closing fast by the time you get there. That means that there's always a risk of losing the rest, or worse, making a bad decision and coming a cropper. As I also discovered, it gives others a chance to react to you. As the road led south, the attitude of the children changed, and in many places it seemed downright mean. The kids would see the first rider coming, would pick up stones, and by the time I got there the stones would be flying across the road. My bike gear saved me from the worst, but I never knew when a large chunk would cause real problems. Until then, the kids had just wanted to wave and to touch the bikes. Their excitement had been fun, and I, for one, hadn't minded them touching the bike, so long as they didn't try to pinch anything. Sally, as pillion rider with hands potentially free, was designated the task of Chief Waver. A couple of times, she'd managed to wave us out of a potentially nasty situation. Trying her technique, I was rather chuffed to find that if I waved just before they threw their stones, the kids would look momentarily confused, drop the stones and wave back. Then I'd be past them. Tombs, temples and pyramids. Rice paddies, donkey-powered milling stones, water buffalo and date palms. The Valley of the Kings by day and Luxor by night. Feluca sailboats, floating tourist hotels, Nile perch and waterborne disease bilharzia. Snowy white egrets, elegant storks and ever active weaver birds. Heat, mosquitoes, cheap hotels, bedbug hunts and a never-ending thirst. Icy cold litres of beer, long days of riding, shared meals and a wonderful sense of freedom kept us enthralled all the way down to Aswan. Here, a huge dam blocks the Nile to form Lake Nasser. This bizarre mass of water in the middle of the desert stretches right over the border and down into Sudan. Aswan itself seemed quite different from anywhere else we'd been to in Egypt. 
The desert comes much closer to the road, as if the money ran out and not the water. The vegetation is sparser and the houses poorer, but the people were incredibly friendly. The crowded nighttime souk was excellent, and the feeling within the market walls was safe and fun. People laughed and joked and called out greetings to each other. The French promenade along their main streets, but here the wealthy Egyptians promenade in their market. The air in the souk was filled with a heady aroma of spices, people, fruit, and baking bread. Around us there were the dramatic sounds of hard and fast bargaining, a game of Egyptian life that everyone seemed to be enjoying in the cool of the evening. To one side of the souk, a bakery was going full tilt. The daylight hours are so hot in this part of the country that the main meal of the day is inevitably eaten in the evening, and Ramadan was just adding to the demand. A man, clad only in a loincloth, rushed out to us as we strolled on by. He'd popped out of a glowing hole in the wall to invite us to come and see bread being made. Inside, rows of semi-clad, sweating men fed flat cakes of dough into the rounded slots of the clay walls and stoked the wood-burning furnaces. I wondered where all the wood came from. In spite of the incredible heat, the men working in the flickering orange light were full of good humour. Cheerful banter zapped back and forth across the room, and the smells from the ovens was delicious. And we left feeling almost full on the scent alone. My first taste of pure desert riding was on asphalt, and the road down to the border was superb. I'd read other people's descriptions about roads that seemed to go on forever until they drop as a dot over the horizon. This one did just that as it stretched out across a landscape of pink, dirty yellow, beige, and grey desert undulations. I'd also read about the deafening silence of the desert. It's really true, but you have to be there. At rest breaks, once the hot ticking from our engines had stopped, there wasn't a sound to be heard. No wind, no cars, no people, no birds—just the sort of silence that makes you want to hold your breath. To the sides, mile after mile of beautiful rolling sand dunes stretched as far as we could see. I felt as if I was riding across the set for Lawrence of Arabia. A phenomenal experience, and the perfect build-up to Abu Simbel. Our guidebook said that the temple was a must, and it was just north of the border with Sudan. Abu Simbel had been transported block by block to its current home overlooking Lake Nasser. If the temple had been left where it was, the new lake behind the dam would have drowned it. It seemed an admirable piece of conservation. Nothing like it had ever been done before. The rumor we'd heard all the way through Egypt was that the Sudanese land border was closed. But while down looking at the temple, we wanted to check out the crossing point for ourselves, just in case. Our only other choice to get into Sudan was by the passenger ferry down the length of the lake. Abu Simbel instantly became my favorite of the wonders of Egypt. In spite of all the World War II Italian squaddies graffiti, the temple is in superb condition. There's a rather spooky, mysterious air to it, and the giant statues are majestic. Both the engineering that went into building it in the first place and the engineering that went into moving it to its new home made it special. For me, it was a kind of exclamation mark at the end of the country. However, at the border, the road was strung with rolls of barbed wire, concrete tank obstacles, and old oil drums with skull and crossbone decoration gave us pretty obvious message: the border was definitely closed. With no way to get across the land border, we decided to make the long dash back to Aswan on the same day, and that dropped us right in it. The wind was getting up, and we desert ignoramuses didn't realise that this heralded a sandstorm. Off we set, running north. Riding the undulating road at speed was rather like riding a roller coaster, but this time fierce side winds made life hard. As the only obstacles for miles, the wind seemed to be enjoying playing a vicious game of skittles with us. Sand drifted across the road, and our spinning wheels caused little whirlwind cones to zip out across the desert. Fine, gritty dust worked its way through our face scarves as we thought to keep the bike upright. Each time I bit down with the effort of doing so, my teeth crunched on the collecting sand that I no longer had the spit to get rid of. The air was so hot and dry that it literally burned the insides of our nostrils as we breathed. On a brief stop, within seconds, our sweat-soaked heads and shirts were bone dry. I started to feel like a sheet of human sandpaper. Finally, the sun dropped down into the blowing storm, 
setting a raging orange glow to the world. As darkness came, we thankfully slipped into the bunkered-down city full of people who'd known better to be out and about. Next day, down at the Nile Navigation Company offices, the slow chase with officials began once more. Tickets had to be bought, and we needed to find out where the number plates could be returned and the carnet's exit stamped. If they weren't, then at some time in the future we'd end up having to pay importation tax and fines for the bikes that we'd already taken out. The offices reminded me of India. Dusty tomes of ledgers lined the shelves. Men sat patiently waiting in the corridors, whilst other men sat officiously in the cubbyhole interiors. The ticket officer said, You want to go to Wadi Halfa? Why? It was my home. I live here now, and this is much better. Africa starts at Wadi Halfa. Not nice at all. We chased around erratically for an hour before a guard helped us out. Until then, I'd felt that I was some sort of overgrown fly bouncing off the inside walls of a glass jar. Lots of noise, but painfully not getting anywhere. The guard took us through a maze of whitewashed corridors until he stopped almost reverently outside one of the offices. After a couple of moments, he pulled himself erect, saluted and stamped his feet together. We were ushered in and then carefully ignored for a few minutes. But the poor commander's eyes were twinkling. Ah, yes, he said. You are needing Mr. Suleiman. Down by the water's edge, we found Mr. Suleiman and his cronies under a corrugated tin-roofed lean-to. Queues of respectful Egyptian and Sudanese men stretched away from his desk and out into the heat. Mr. Suleiman was obviously the kingpin of the docks, and as he seemed to like the look of us, everything went amazingly smoothly. Ramadan ended at 3.30am on our last day in Egypt, with the honking horns, the rejuvenated yelling song from the Mezuin, and the people rushing through the streets, calling and shouting to each other. Having had this early start to the day, we were up and packed and ready to head for the docks in good time. Goodbyes to the others were hard, especially as it felt like the end of an era. Mike, Sally and I were also conscious that heading for the Sudan was even more like stepping out into the unknown than Egypt had been. The only thing to do was to get on with it. With the weight of extra desert supplies strapped to the bike, it felt like I was riding a drunken pig again, and if Mike hadn't been around, I'd probably have been riding with a broken shaft drive. With the first set of potholes, you'll be in big trouble. You haven't wound the suspension hard enough, he said. This lucky escape meant that the day started well. But then it slipped into a scene from the script of a farce. As the play unfolded around us, Bakshish, bribe money, was demanded. And the rushing confusion felt like it was being orchestrated to make life more difficult for everyone. For hour after hour, white and blue-clad porters poured past us with incredible loads of luggage. As the bikes would have to go in the entrance corridor, we were destined to be last aboard and that gave us plenty of time to sit and watch. Pickup trucks rolled by, straining with loads twice as high as their cabs. Orders were shouted. A lost child cried, a donkey brayed frantically, a boat's horn tooted somewhere, and I began to wonder where on earth everything was going to fit and how they were going to possibly unravel what belonged to whom. When our turn came... We managed to recruit five of the porters to help heave the bikes over the plank and down the two four-foot drops from the deck pontoons into the entrance gangway of the ferry. The gangway was filling up fast. Soon there wouldn't be two BMW-sized spaces left. But with Sally watching our pile of unloaded gear, all was going well, until suddenly there were just two helpers instead of five. My bike was left teetering on the edge of the drop over the lake. With calm from Mike, curses from me and indifference from my helpers, both bikes eventually nestled safely amongst sacks of rice, trusses of chickens, goats, bags of beans and rusty black bicycles that looked as if they had been around since colonial days. The inside of the boat was filthy and the constant spitting on everything that stayed still long enough to be spat on just added a lovely patina to the mess. The men's toilet floor floated with two inches of urine, old newspapers and cigarette butts which clustered together like little bobbing islands. Sally said the ladies' toilet was just as bad. In the cafeteria, stainless steel trays were full of brown, crusty sludge, and our tuna sandwiches seemed like curd on blood delicacy in comparison. With nowhere else remotely clean to sit, we climbed over the roof chain railings and onto the baking hot but empty space. 
In the clear air, the stark view was amazing. Nothing but three clear lines of water, sand, and sky. Next stop, real Africa. All right, well, there you have it. Make sure you tune in next week for Sam's reading from his book, Under Asian Skies. Until then, visit us on our Patreon account at patreon.com slash adventuresportspodcast and get out and have some fun.